Good morning. Morning. Everybody should have two separate handout sheets this morning. One for each comparable to look at. Yeah, I've got a few verses here. So I'll volunteer to read them for me when we get there. Anybody else? Somebody that denies the very existence of God, where do you start? You don't exactly start with all of sin to come short of the glory of God. You know, they don't believe in God. So you back up and do something like Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Talk to him about creation and the things that God has done that we can see. But to no avail. None of that may be given from sight. I didn't really expect it would at that point. I, mean, I was hoping that maybe we'd, uh, I could plant some seeds and things would, you know, over time the Spirit of God could use it. But that uh, experience is just very, very sad when you have something like that uh, take place. Because you're talking to someone who has absolutely no hope of anything other than here and now, and it's not good, and it's going to soon end anyway. And what does it all matter? We all die, and that's the end. That's a pretty hopeless, bleak outlook. Uh, it, it's one that I am very thankful that I don't have, because I, I think you would agree, if it was not for the promises we have in God's Word, if it was not for the future that we have before us that we know uh, it's true. It'd be difficult living in this world. It'd be difficult making it day to day. <clears throat> well, this morning we're going to look at it, the last two parables. And I want these two parables to scream hope, assurance, peace, and all of that, which I, I, I'm sure they will. It's God's word, but uh, that, that's what I'm seeing, and that's what I'm drawing from it, and, and I think you will do the same. It's not just that we're talking about prophetic events, or present day situation, but we're talking also about and looking forward now. At this point, when we come to this 
juncture in these series of parables. It's, it's all about looking forward to something else that is much, much better. So the parable of the pearl of great price. Now keep your Bibles handy. Later on we'll probably have to turn to a passage and look at it, uh, get together. But right now let me just read this two, the two verses. Verses 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. That's all that is said. What are we going to make of this? Well, let's just reboot this thing and see what happens. But uh, we'll take a second. sounds very much like the parable of the hidden treasure. A man found a treasure in a field and he went and sold everything he had and bought the field. But as we noticed last week, that finding of treasure buried in the field in that day in that culture and in their legal system meant that it belonged to him and he only bought the field with everything he had because the treasure that he already owned was, all, was so expensive and worth so much that he wanted to keep it hidden. You read the parable of the pearl of great price, it almost sounds the same. A, a merchant seeking fine pearls finds one exquisite pearl that is worth more than anything he can imagine. And he goes and sells all that he already possesses, all the pearls he has, all his belongings, all his uh, wealth, and buys that one pearl. It kind of seems like a repetition, but it is not at all. It's not redundant. It is similar, you see, in that it demonstrates the great value of the kingdom of God. But it does so from an entirely different standpoint. That's what we'll need to understand. Whereas the treasure of the kingdom of heaven, whereas the treasure in the previous parable was like the kingdom of heaven, this parable, the parable of the pearl, says that the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant. In the previous parable, you go back to verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. The point of the hidden treasure, the kingdom of heaven is like the treasure. It has great value. But in this parable, he says, he doesn't say the kingdom of heaven is like the pearl. That's the first tip off. This is a little different. He says, it's like the merchant, the guy who bought the pearl. Furthermore, in the parable of the hidden treasure, the treasure was free. The man found it in the field, finders, keepers, rabbinic law in those days. It was his. It didn't matter whose field it was in. We might think, well, it was in the other guy's field. It should belong to him. That was not their law. It was, a, it was a free discovery, and it was his. And he had every right to remove it from the field, do whatever he wanted to with it. Now, the very fact that it's not stated in that parable, the very fact that he was able to buy the field from the owner to keep it there shows that the owner himself had no idea it was there. So it wasn't his. The parable of the hidden treasure, the parable, or the, excuse me, in the parable of the hidden treasure, the treasure was free for the taking to the man who found it. But in the pearl of great price, the pearl of great price has to be obtained by making a transaction. There's a cost 
to obtaining the pearl. So the pearl of a the pearl of great price illustrates the great cost to who? Who's the merchant here? God. The kingdom of heaven is like the merchant who bought the pearl. It's talking about the great cost to God for making the kingdom of heaven available to us. Of course, we know that was the incarnation of God the Son, his substitutionary death on the cross, redemption he provided for us, the greatest cost imaginable. We just recently um, had a series of sermons uh, that we were able to listen to as Pastor Dave presented them to us. You remember when Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There was, there was a separation somehow spiritually between God the Father and God the Son. It was unimaginable beyond the physical suffering of his death. And that took place in that last three hours. It was a tremendous price that God paid to make grace available to us here in this day in which we live, which Jesus is referring to as the kingdom of heaven. Remember, kingdom of heaven means the kingdom from heaven. It exists here. And it's made up of individuals through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, so far, let's just look at this. There's been three sets of parables we've looked at. The first two are very similar. Both refer to human responses or satanic responses to the kingdom. The human responses we have the four soils. The satanic response was the sowing of the tares. Then we came to the mustard seed and the leaven, the second pair. The mustard seed demonstrates the numeric growth of the kingdom. The leaven presents the idea of our influence in the world. Not everybody in the world becomes a part of the kingdom. Not everybody's a part of that growth. In spite of the fantastic growth of God's church, the kingdom, whatever you want to call it, in this dispensation, there's still more people out there that have rejected Christ. But we still have an influence in this world for good. We are the soul of the earth, the light of the world. So those two kind of go together. And then we just dealt with the treasure and the pearl. The treasure demonstrating the great value to being a part of that kingdom. Nothing else compares. Uh, what, what shall a man give for his soul, right? Okay. And then the second aspect, or the, the alternative or corresponding perspective, that possibility for us to have that which is most valuable to us came at great cost to God. So, if we're going to write down an interpretation, and you can phrase it in a lot of different ways, but I want to emphasize the establishment of the kingdom of heaven came at great cost because it was the death of Jesus Christ that laid the basis for salvation. Now, it, it's appropriated through faith, but he died for everybody. So he established that connection we could have through faith in Jesus Christ. The establishment of the kingdom came at great cost. That seems to be the basic interpretation of the parable of the pearl. So what about an application? Well, the greatest possible price that was paid for our salvation by God. And it requires that we glorify Him in everything we do. I don't think I gave out this one, so give me a chance to turn there quickly. Very important verse, 1 Corinthians 6.20. Here Paul says, one more page. Okay. For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, 
glorify God in your body. Every day we live, every breath we take as a child of God, a new creature in Christ, was purchased at the highest possible cost to God. Therefore, <clears throat> that price being paid, everything we do, everything we say, everything we think, everything we are in this world should be directed to one end, and that is glorifying God. That's kind of one of those theological words we don't always understand entirely or think about. It comes from the word which means light. Without light, we don't see anything. Light brings everything to light, right? We have to bring God Almighty to light in this world. We are the only ones who can do that. It, it's all about what we do, what we say, what we don't do, what we don't say, how we act, how we don't, do not act, all that, everything. We tend, to, we tend to prioritize things and, and think of a hierarchy. Well, this, this is really important, you know. Christian ought to do this. This is not quite important. It's all important. It's all of equal importance. Because everything we do bears on the, the glory of God. It, it, it says something about the God in whom we believe and the God to whom we belong. Well, that's a whole sermon in itself, so... You're probably better move on to the next parable. The parable of the dragnet. Now this is in verses 47 to 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea, gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach. They sat down and gathered the good fish in the containers, but the bad they threw away. Now, in this particular parable, we have the explanation here given to us as to what it means. Jesus himself says, so it will be at the end of the age. So this is the last parable, and now he's, he's moved all the way through the period of time to the end that, that the kingdom of heaven encompasses. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the dragnet. The last of the seven. Now, the other the other six kind of come to us in two, two, and two. Three couples. There's only one on the end. But when you think about it, this last parable has a twofold application, if you will, because if those that are separated out and are cast into a place of suffering, there's some left. So there's a, there's a double uh, meaning there to that. Plus, if you go back to the parable of the tares or the weeds, let's let's just flip back there. Uh, this is chapter 13, verse 30. The owner says, don't, don't pull up the tares. He might damage the weed. We, it's hard to tell the harvest is going. We're going to wait. He says, allow both to grow together until the harvest. And, then in the, and in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. And of course... We understand the meaning of that. So he, he is already in the parable of the tares jumped forward to this final judgment. So there is kind of like a, a, a couplet in between. Because this one and this one kind of go together also as well as this one and this one. Just an interesting observation. The context. The seventh parable deals with the judgment that occurs at the end of the interim period that we're calling, or Jesus called, 
the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> Verse 49, he says this, so it will be at the end of the age. What age? The age characterized by, <coughs> occupied by the kingdom of heaven. It's not, it's not the age after the millennium, another thousand years away, or even the new heavens and the new earth. No, it's the end of the age that comes to an end at the end of the tribulation period. The Greek word translated dragnet here refers to a large net with weights on the bottom and floats at the top. So it would be a large rectangular <coughs> net that floats weights. And is told by a boat, the boat travels in a circular motion, enclosing everything inside as the net is closed into a large circle. And it captures every fish in its path. Well, I suppose a very small fish might not get out or whatever, but basically it's designed to just be indiscriminate, to just gather them all within that area. The circle then is gradually closed and pulled ashore by the boat. Those boats over there are only about 15 or 16 feet, or were about 15 or 16 feet in length. And they're not motorized, obviously, so uh, kind of difficult for men to stand on that boat and then try to haul in a, a huge haul of fish. So they, typically they pulled it to shore. Modern fishing boats use the same method, except it's drawn into the boat. Now, again, we've already noted this. Jesus explained the parable in verses 49 and 50. The time of judgment will be at the end of the age, the end of the kingdom of heaven, and the angels will be the instruments of God's judgment, separating the wicked from the righteous. Because, again, this parable was drawn from everyday life in Galilee, Israel. These fishing boats would pull the nets to the shore, They'd drag the nets up on the land, and they would sit there, and some fish weren't worth keeping. They weren't keepers. They weren't good to eat, or they weren't big enough, whatever. And they throw them back into the sea, or just maybe dispose of them if they were trash fish of some sort. But they would keep the ones, obviously, that they wanted to uh, sell for folks to consume. So the angels here, synonymous with or uh, compared to that. <clears throat> this will coincide with the end of the tribulation period and the return of Jesus Christ. Remember, we've said all along, the interim period in which the kingdom of heaven exists is between the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. His incarnation, life, death, you know, and basically then he's telling this just before his death. So at that point, the kingdom of heaven occupies the rest of the space till his second coming at the end of the tribulation. So, again, looking at this chart, here's the cross, his death and resurrection, and then the kingdom of heaven stretches all the way through what is commonly called the church age. That's where we are at. Sometime yet future, although it could, be, it could begin today, we don't know, but at some time in the future, the church will be removed. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and following, the rapture. Then we will have seven years of tribulation. Here on the chart, I'm divided into three and a half, and three and a half as uh, the scripture does in Revelation in the book of Daniel as well. And Matthew 24. By the way, in two weeks, we'll go to Matthew 24, which kind of follows up everything we've learned in chapter 13. And uh, we might cover just 24, we might stretch it in 25, we'll see. But uh, very interesting to compare these two uh, sections of the Gospel of Matthew. <clears throat> but when Jesus Christ returns, <coughs> After the seven-year tribulation period, 
that he will establish the millennial kingdom here. But it is at this point that the parable of the dragnet is picturing for us the judgment that will take place at that moment. So this is how we know the kingdom of heaven stretches to this point. Now, the wicked individuals who survive the tribulation period, there will be a lot of unbelievers who will survive the tribulation. They will lose their lives at the time of the Christ coming, the great battle of Armageddon, the destruction of Antichrist and all of his cohorts. But many of those who receive the mark of the beast, rejected Christ, will survive. They won't all be killed. But they won't survive the coming of Christ uh, and the judgment that follows. And so in the judgment then they will be, they'll obviously have to lose their physical life and they'll be cast into a place of torment. Now compare, I think in your notes there it says compare Luke 16, that's a parable of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man uh, goes to a place of torment. That's the place of suffering or we would refer to it as hell prior to the re last resurrection of the unsaved. We'll get to that in a moment. One thousand years later, they will be resurrected. Judge at the great white throne and cast into the lake of fire. That's Revelation 20, 11 to 15. But they will enter into a place of suffering, not the lake of fire, a place of torment it's called in Luke 16 until that final resurrection of their bodies and final judgment. Although it's not stated in this parable, the righteous people who survive the tribulation will enter into the millennial kingdom in their mortal bodies. Now, those of us who've been raptured, and I hope it's all of us, but whether we're raptured or resurrected at the day of the rapture, uh, we will come back with Christ when he returns. And we will be immortal resurrect, in resurrected bodies. But some believers who survive the tribulation will not yet have died. And they enter into the millennium. And we will help, by the way, we're told this, and we'll come back to it, I think, in a moment. We will help Christ rule and reign over this world during that thousand years. Those of us that are previously died been resurrected. Or rapture. <coughs> Interpretation, the kingdom of heaven will conclude with the judgment of all who survive the tribulation. Well, let's talk about this judgment for a moment. I want you to turn to the, go ahead and turn to Matthew 25. Again, we'll get to this later, but let's turn over there. Something that you'll recognize. Matthew 25. Beginning at verse 31. And when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all of his angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. This is a description of the judgment that the parable of the dragnet has told us about. It's more definitive in Matthew 25. This is more description. So the Son of Man comes in his glory, with all of his angels with him, he'll sit on the throne of his glorious, sit on the, uh, his glorious throne, and he'll be there to, to judge. The angels are there, which is pointed out here, and the angels are instruments of his judgment, as we saw in Matthew 13. Look at verse 32. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one uh, separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So he put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now, do not be thrown off by the English translation nations. All the nations will be gathered before him. Because this is typically referred to as the judgment of the nations. And it's typically compared to the previous parable of the talents, which we're very familiar with. Look back, if you will, in chapter 25 to verse 14, where the parable of the talents begins. And it says, 
For it is just like a man about to go on a journey, and he called his own slaves. Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, refers to God's final judgment on Jewish people, his own. The parable, or the judgment here of the nations, refers to the Gentiles, not the United States, not nations like the United States or Mexico or, or you know, Spain or whatever. That's not what it's talking about. The word translated nations is the typical Greek word is translated Gentiles most everywhere else. It just means non-Jews. But people are judged individually. It doesn't, it's not saying if you live in an unrighteous nation you're going to be lost because you didn't live the right way. This, this is not referring to nations in that sense at all. Just referring to people that are not Jewish. But it's an individual judgment of each person. Now, if you look at verse 34, the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Okay, we just placed this judgment signified by the dragnet parable at the end of the tribulation period. Now we're seeing a description and those who are believers who enter in in immortal bodies after the judgment of the unbelievers, the goats here it would be, he says this, Come you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Inherit the kingdom. That's the millennial kingdom that comes next. That's the kingdom he's talking about here. Don't get confused because we've talked about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom from heaven that exists until the coming of Jesus. Now he's talking about entering in and inheriting the millennial kingdom. This verse is really fascinating, verse 34 here of Matthew 25. The king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed. That is a perfect tense in the original, which means it's talking about something that happened in the past, the effects or the blessing of which has continued and will continue on into the future. So when we read this, when we read this, we understand we are blessed. We already possess the right to inherit. It's ours. It just hasn't been transferred to us yet in the sense. This, is, this, is a, this illustration will fall apart, but it's like anybody who, who dies and has a will, the, the assets don't pass until officially the other person has died and uh, you know, all the legal matters are taking place and it's transferred. Well, obviously, what we inherit doesn't come because of the death of God or anything like that, but there will come a point in which we will inherit it all. But the, the point of this is, we already are an heir. We're already an heir. Now there's where hope, there's where when we focus on what the scripture says, we begin to be able to look past our present circumstances, and our present suffering, and the present trials of this world, and then the evil in this world, and all the rest. And then he goes on to say, well, you know, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. And they say, well, when did we do that? And he says, this is, this is key. Down to verse 46. Truly I say to you, the extent that you did it to one of these, the brothers of mine. Now he's talking about the Jewish people. Because believers in the tribulation period, resisting with Jewish believers and those who realize their connection and treated each other right. It's not, not teaching salvation by words, but it's just giving proof of their belief, proof of their faith, that's all. And then when it comes to the goats, they don't do these things, and that's proof they did not believe. That's all that is. Anyway, that's the uh, little further commentary there on... Uh, that judgment. Remember, the ultimate authority, God delegated to Adam, Adam sinned, he 
turn that over to Satan. He yielded to Satan's will. Satan usurped God's authority. Satan established the kingdoms of this world. Through Jesus Christ, the kingdom of heaven was established as a beachhead, a foothold in this world from the first coming to the second coming. And those who believe are a part of that. It's not a political kingdom. It is a body. The church is a body of Christ connected to the spirit of God. And we will see great growth and have great influence. But ultimately, the kingdoms of the world are all defeated, destroyed, through the tribulation period, particularly at the Battle of Armageddon. And then all this, the millennial kingdom, surplants the kingdom of heaven, or this is rolled into it, however you want to look at it. And this is a reestablishment of God's authority over his original creation. Now, this is on your sheet. Don't, don't stress over this. I know you'll probably have questions about it. Everybody does. It's hard for me to keep it all straight. Uh, I'm going to give you another handout sheet. At least I'm not going to pass it out. But when you depart, if you come up here and get one of these, you'll have a full explanation of each of these with the scripture references so you can do further study on your own. So we don't have time to really dwell on that, and that's not our purpose. But I think it's important to note here. the resurrection, Christ's resurrection on the third day. A few Old Testament believers right after Christ's resurrection. Remember that? That fulfills the typology of the first fruits. There's only a few. And then the church age saints at the rapture. The Old Testament believers, it, there's, there's biblical evidence going way back to Daniel, the Old Testament believers will be resurrected at the end of the tribulation period at the second coming of Christ, as will the tribulation saints at the same time, because all, they missed the rapture. They came to faith later. The, those people that survive the tribulation and go into the millennium that are believers will repopulate the world, and not all them will be believers, but those who enter in as believers will the scripture doesn't say that it'll probably be at the end of the millennium. Uh, there was a question about how long people will live and if there'll be any death and all that. But again, that's another discussion. And then finally, the unsaved of all ages, all ages, <coughs> will be resurrected at the end of the millennium, the great white throne judgment, Revelation chapter 20. So there's various resurrections for various groups of people. And I know you all are, are, have been taught, <laughs> but believe me, the expanse of Christendom worldwide, most people don't have any concept of this. They just think, one judgment, the end, and that's it. They miss all this prophetic uh, reality. But if it wasn't for this, where would our hope come from? Or, you know, I mean, this is, this is so magnificent to be able to just see all this in advance, right there on the page. So here are some realities to ponder. Who's got Acts 1-8? Okay. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We shall, or he says, you shall be witnesses. He didn't say you might be. He didn't say you could be. He says you shall be. That's important to me. Now, there's times we're not very good witnesses. There might be times when we don't witness at all. But every one of us has a witness. And we have the power. That is dunamis. That's the Greek word for which we get the English dynamite. The Holy Spirit comes, and we therefore we have the power to be witnesses because He transforms our life. That's our function as far as the world is concerned. That's we go back to glorifying God in everything that we do. 
We will be spared. Here's another reality to ponder. We will be spared from the judgments of the tribulation. I'm sure glad of that. It's bad enough right now what we have to deal with in this world. Number three, we will, we will experience the return of Christ. You say, wait a minute, we were raptured. We're not going to be here. Uh oh, wait a minute. Who's done Revelation 19, 14? And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Let's read that again. 1914. Yeah, I made a good, I made the wrong verse. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, no, that's following right. him on white horses. That's right. The armies of heaven, who's that going to be? I see. Who's going to be wearing the white robe? We are. Sorry, not your fault. But um, we're not going to miss anything. We're going to be present at the rapture. You say, well, yeah, if we're still alive. No, we're going to be present at the rapture, period. Because the dead in Christ rises first. Then those who are left are caught up. And we're going to experience the rapture. We're going to experience the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're coming back with him. We're going to see it all. We're going to experience it all. We're going to be part of it. This isn't just something that's going to happen to somebody else we're talking about here. I don't know about you, but that gets me excited. I'm, I'm sure you can say this up. Now, on top of that, we will reign with the Lord during the millennium. Somebody have that 20, maybe it's 24. I saw thrones on which received those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. We'll reign with him. <clears throat> He's not going to need us to take care of this world. But he's going to give us the privilege of doing it for him. He's going to reign from the throne in Jerusalem. But we're going to, we're going to administrate, rule, oversee matters in this world during the millennium, which will involve overseeing a lot of people that are not yet died, they born after they after the second coming of Christ from those people that entered into mortal bodies. So they're going to need everything we have to offer as resurrected already believers. That's pretty incredible. There's even a parable in the New Testament talking with Jesus and he uses the example of rewarding with giving him so many cities. Remember that? Then, then, then we will never experience death, sorrow, or pain. Revelation 21, 4. Who's got that one? I do. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall no longer be any deaths. There shall no longer be any mourning, or crying, or pain. The first things have passed away. And I don't think I gave anybody Revelation 21, 7. This is after the millennium. This is in the new heavens and the new earth. It says again, we will reign with him when he creates new heavens and new earth. Okay. We haven't even begun to be all that God intends for us to be. We haven't begun to do all the things that God intends for us to do. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get a little frustrated because I, I can't do what I think God would have me do, but God somehow hasn't allowed me to do it. Believe me, we're going to have plenty to do. We're not going to be hindered. It's going to be marvelous. I mean, over and over and over and over again, there is, I use the term hope, but it's better, better described as the word assurance, the future blessing. I'm sure glad I'm not an atheist. How about you? <laughs> but those who do not partake of this, they will do so of their own choice. 
go back to the parable there in Matthew, or the, the description of the judgment of the nations in Matthew 25, when he says, well, the ones that will enter in, they fed, clothed, ministered to the Jewish people during the tribulation. What they did reflected who they were, and the ones who didn't do that thing did, did not do those things to his brethren. What they didn't do reflected who they were. And when he says that in verse 45 to those people, the judgment, he says, then he will answer them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. It's you, second, it, it's clearly in the original, a second person, when you didn't do it. Now what am I, what am I drawing from that? Sometimes we feel, sometimes, uh, I'm afraid many times, we've been made to feel extremely guilty because we haven't witnessed everybody we happen to bump into and we haven't led so many people to Christ this week and, and all those things. And, and I don't know about you, but I, I, over the years I can, I can remember many sermons that made it seem like it was, well, if somebody that I know doesn't make it to heaven, it's somehow my fault. Not what Jesus said. He said, the ones who chose, second person, you, the ones he's talking to that day, he didn't bring us into it. We're not going to be held accountable for those that go to hell. They will be held accountable because they made choices. And whether we were faithful in giving them our witness at one juncture in time or not, they will have plenty of other witnesses. If nothing else, he'll have those heavens that declare the glory of God that David wrote about in Psalm 19. Personal responsibility. So don't let anybody throw cold water. I know we should be a witness and, and we should be faithful, but don't let anybody cold, throw cold water on your joy somehow that it's going to be your fault if somebody else doesn't get there. It's not. thousand times more than you can even imagine on top of that. I want to say that I'm a grown woman married to the pastor and I went to Bible college and I never realized that it was the merchant who was the kingdom of like the kingdom of God, not the pearl. Well, it's, it's a bit of when we refer to it as the parable of the pearl of great price. Right. Because it really should be called the parable of the virgin. <laughs> right. I never know. Sometimes we... I, I, I'll tell you, I didn't understand this for many years. Because the typical way it's, these are translated or thought about, not necessarily the right way. Our, our women's Bible study just finished uh, the book, a year study on Revelation. And yeah, it is deep. It is, we, we covered the whole Bible in verifications and all of this. The parables and how it relates what you presented. 
and how it relates to revelation and progression and comparisons. It's just more than we can really digest, but yet it's bringing. And after doing Revelation, I, I think most of my class and the other women just felt freer and full of joy despite all we went through. <laughs> and it's not all comfortable, but in the end, almost the end of every lesson, um, we agreed to believe this by faith because we couldn't always dot all the I's and cross all the T's, but it all had a message. Anyway, um, we come back to Matthew 24, we're going to start there two weeks. You're going to see amazing things line up with what you're studying right now. It's, uh, the scripture is so consistent and so perfect without error. Amazing. Well, I hope you've been encouraged and lifted up. I know I have. Just, just sitting at home this morning, going over all this in my mind, made me rethink my attitudes in a lot of ways. So, thank the Lord for this. Let's just pray together, friends and forth. Oh, Father, we just we thank you for all you revealed to us. You didn't have to tell us these things, Lord, but you put them there before us in your word to give us great peace and hope and joy. Lord, it is it's an, it's an aspect of your grace, Lord, that we just uh, we can't fully comprehend. We praise you for it. We look forward to it, Father. We thank you for this time to look at it together. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget, if you want more information on the resurrection, you can pick up the